And so in the dangerous times that we are in, we're going to need God's rest more and more. And when we talk about God's rest, we're really talking about abiding in the peace and in the joy of God. We're not, God's rest is not inactivity, even though we might enjoy inactivity. You can be very busy and still be resting in God because God's rest and God's peace is really a state. It's a condition of the heart. We are, we may be very busy, we may even be under critical deadlines, whatever, but we can still be at peace in our heart no matter what the circumstances around us are doing. And so that's really what we want to talk about. Two essential steps to entering God's rest. The first step is an absolute surrender. And we spent quite a bit of time last week talking about how in our heart, you know, we, we sometimes strive and struggle and we want things to be different or we want things to be better. And we try to control people. We try to control circumstances. Uh, control is kind of the, the, the heartbeat of the depraved heart. And so we want to be, make sure that our life is comfortable and as we would have it. Have you ever seen those interviews where there's some athlete or uh, maybe it's a, a very wealthy person, businessman, and, and they get on and they're at some you know, mountaintop of their success, some pinnacle of success that they finally reached, and they say, I just want to tell you all that you can do whatever you want to do and you can be whatever you want to be. Have any of you ever listened to those type of messages and think, uh, that didn't work for me? That doesn't work in real life. And it really doesn't. Because we are in the mindset of, I don't just say tomorrow I'm going to go to the market and buy and sell. What do we say? We say, if the Lord wills. We recognize that we are always under His sovereignty that we are always under his lordship, that he is the master, we are the servant, and we do his bidding, we don't do our own bidding. And so here, so there's, there's got to be that heart of absolute surrender, which was missing in Israel's heart here in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, and it's not if, because he rarely speaks. God is, I think, continually wooing us, especially his children, continually speaking to us through his word, through the voice of his Holy Spirit. But that if there, in the beginning of that sentence, it means it's possible that God is speaking to you right now and you're not hearing. You're not listening. And so... Rest really starts at hearing his voice. Because when you hear his voice, that's when that faith and that comfort and that assurance is birthed in your heart. And so you can relax and rest. But so many times, and you, and you know, you take the illustration of, of Martha and Mary. Mary was listening to Jesus' voice, but Martha was too busy. And so if we get frantic in our own activity or we get fearful and anxious and we're we're struggling trying to make things happen make things work trying to correct something that's gone wrong or to make things go a certain way we won't be able to hear his voice and we won't have that peace and that assurance in our hearts so he says today if you hear his voice do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness and so like we said last week, this basically boils down to this. The Israelites didn't like their set of circumstances. I think that initially they were overjoyed at being set free from the slavery of Egypt. And who wouldn't like to see the Red Sea open up and you cross over on dry ground? I mean, that was such a great miracle to live through, right? But then they got on the other side and they end up in this wilderness where there's no food and there's no water. 
And when you take away someone's water and food, people do get quite desperate. And so suddenly they don't like this set of circumstances, even though God is miraculously providing water out of a rock, even though He's miraculously providing manna every day, even though He accompanies them with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night so that no enemies can approach them, they still didn't like the circumstances. They wanted something comfortable, something that made them feel good, and here out in the wilderness they were not in their safe zone, so they thought. They were not comfortable out there. This was hard. And all of the fears were rushing in of what's going to happen to us. Remember how many times they told uh, Moses and Aaron, you've brought us out here to what? To kill us so that we would die in the wilderness. And so when he says, he's, when he says here, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, he's talking about the fact that when you find yourself in certain circumstances and situations in your life, maybe your life didn't turn out the way you wanted it to. Maybe you have had hardships in your life that you would prefer to have never had. Maybe there's been tragedy in your life that still shapes your life today. And you kind of live in the shadow or in the scars of, of trauma that was done in the past. How do we handle those things? He says here in verse 8, do not harden your hearts. Don't become stiff and resistant. Don't say, God, why did you let this happen to me? Why couldn't have things been different? Why couldn't you have answered my prayers sooner? And when that starts to happen, when you start to, that obstinance and stubbornness begins to solidify in your heart, your heart becomes hardened against God, and it can even turn into complaining and accusation against God. We see that in the life of Job, unfortunately. So as you're going through life on a daily basis, and when you realize just out of control how much out of control you really are of things that happen, those are the times that you don't harden your heart, but you go to God and you realize, my God is in control. I'm not, but He is. And so this wilderness journey was called the day of testing. Because your heart is being tested. Will you submit to God's plan for your life? Are you able to say, these circumstances are hard, but God is with me. And so I can be at peace because I know He's in control. I'm uncomfortable myself not being in control, but I know the God who is in control. And so I can rest easy in Him. He says in verse 9, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. 40 years of miracles, and Israel still hardened her heart. God help us that we never get in that state. But we began to see last week that if you will accept the things that God brings into your life, as either initiated by God or allowed by God, and there's a difference. If you will surrender to the plan of God for your life, He will work miracles. And you will be, in the end, so thankful for that journey. You didn't want to go there. You maybe even hated it at first. But then as you surrendered to the will of God through the years and saw everything that He did, the miracles, the comfort, the peace, how close you drew to Him in those times of desperation, you will be thankful for the Lord taking you down that path. He says, Therefore I was provoked with that generation and said, They always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. And we look through our little peephole into life and it's all distorted. We really know nothing compared to what the master architect knows. We really know nothing. His, his ways are so much higher than our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. He knows into perfect infinity. 
He knows the beginning from the end. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He knows what's going on. And what He's doing is right. And it's good for you. Even though we don't recognize it at the moment. But if we, if our heart descends into complaining and even accusing God and hardening our hearts, you are only making the trial much, much worse for yourself. If you would just give up and surrender to His will and ride it out and watch how His grace and His power will keep you and preserve you. But He said, no, the Israelites, they always went astray. They're always grumbling, always complaining about the circumstances that faced them They didn't understand that this was my pathway of deliverance. The very things that you grumble and complain about, God is using them as your pathway of deliverance. And God will deliver you. God will mold you. He will set you free internally from all of those things that are causing that discontentment and depression and sadness. Verse 11, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. God was long-suffering with them for 40 years, showing them miracles year after year, and and it was never good enough for them. God was never good enough for them. They wanted the delicacies. They wanted what they thought they had to have in life to be happy. Job chapter 3, verse 11, we saw this last week of the depths that we can sink to, where Job says, why did, I not, why did I not die at birth? Why did I not come out from the womb and expire? For then I would have at least laid down and been quiet. I would have slept. Then I would have been at rest. And we saw last week, all of God's servants have been through this. We all go through times of disillusionment. We all go through times of great pain. Be patient with someone in great pain, whether it be emotional or whether it be physical or whether it be mental. They are in a torment and they, uh, it's very easy to speak things that you don't mean. You're, you're speaking in the pain of the moment. And I think that's what we see Job doing here. We see David doing it. But whether you talk about Paul or Jesus or Peter, every saint has gone through this trial. Every saint has gone through this turmoil, and it's leading you to the ultimate test. Will you surrender to God's will? Will you surrender to Him as a living sacrifice? And when you do, you will be amazed at the peace and the grace and the enabling power that God brings. We err in our heart when we think that a change in circumstances will bring us peace and rest. Circumstantial peace is flimsy, fragile, plastic, and fleeting. Just wishing that things could be my way or different. And let me just say, I I understand we are human beings, and circumstances do have a real effect on our lives. They have a real effect on our mood, our attitude, our thoughts. But above the circumstances, there's a peace that we can find in the presence of God that will guide us through those times. The inner striving and the struggle of trying to stay in control to manipulate people and circumstances is at best futile and exhausting. Boy, you get so tired trying to manage life on your own. At worst, it places you in a direct strife and conflict with God, in direct conflict with His plan and even with other individuals. James 4 says it perfectly. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? Before you come to that surrender of an absolute sacrifice and and you're totally pliable in God's hands and in His plan for your life, your passions are at war. You're miserable inside. And you can't do anything about it. You can't change what is happening or what has happened. And inside there's this war of, I've got to get control, I've got to fight back, I've got to do this, I've got to do that. 
and you are miserable on the inside. He says you desire and do not have, so you murder, you covet, you cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you don't ask. Why aren't you going to your heavenly Father and laying these burdens at His feet, asking Him for His perception, His direction, His wisdom in the matter? And he says, then when you do ask, you don't receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own passions. Instead of coming to God and saying, God, I am a living sacrifice. You are the Lord. You are the master. I'm the servant. I'm obeying you. I'm entirely surrendered to your will. That's the kind of praying that will get to results. He's saying, instead, you come to God and say, God, why aren't you doing what I want you to do? And what's taking you so long, by the way? And when you pray like that, your prayers won't be answered, James is saying, right? We know and experience God's peace and rest when we stop struggling and striving within our own heart and just absolutely surrender to God, His plan, His wisdom, and His timing. Peace, rest, joy only come from being a living sacrifice. Absolutely surrendered to God, knowing that whatever comes, I am in the center of God's will and in the center of His care. We have to trust that. We need to know the love of God for us to so much greater degree than we know. And then I put this in the notes because I thought this would be important to at least mention, even if we don't go deeply into it. But being a living sacrifice, surrendered absolutely to God's plan, does not mean that you never push back. And it does not mean that you continue in a bad situation when there's an opportunity to leave. So, when bad times come, or when hard times come, and even when good times come, you know, we don't start singing uh, K Sera Sera with Dar's Day. Is she still alive? or? No, she passed on. Whatever will be, will be. We, we don't have that type of an attitude. Well, this is coming my way, so I guess I just have to submit to whatever. No, not necessarily. These are the times when you really have to be surrendered to God's will, but you also have to seek for His wisdom and His guidance. And I put there, remember Paul appealing to Caesar as a Roman citizen in Acts chapter 22 and Acts chapter 25. That's a lengthy passage, and we certainly don't have time to dive into that this morning. But remember, you know, the Roman soldiers, soldiers stepped in and they saved Paul from a Jewish mob that was going to kill him. And so the Roman soldiers step in, and now he's kind of being guarded under their authority. And there were times where uh, the Roman governor wanted to turn Paul over to the Jews or take him back to Jerusalem. And remember, Paul's, uh, he pushed back. He said, you know, I'm a Roman citizen, right? Which scared the, the uh, living whatever out of the Roman soldiers because they knew that they had crossed a line and they were concerned now that this Roman citizen could bring accusation against them. And so they back off. And then a little bit later in the narrative, Paul says, I appeal to Caesar. And that's how he ends up going to Rome. And so there are times when we do push back. There, there are times when uh, and I say this kind of hesitantly, but there are times where, you know, a lawsuit might be the way to go. Um, you don't necessarily have to accept everything as it comes your way. If you remember, uh, there was a time when I was going through a lot of stress on the job that I have right now. And so I went and I interviewed with a job for a job uh, at Boeing. And... You know, when I, when I first applied for the job, there were several people on the Boeing end that said, you're perfect for the job. You, you, you check like nine out of the 10 boxes. This would be great. 
And then at the last minute, they gave it to someone else. So when that happened, what did I do? It would be easy to say, God, you betrayed me. This was my chance to get out of this situation. You let me down. But at that point, and, and you know, there was disappointment in my heart for sure. But yet I had to conclude then this is the will of God. And that's part of the testing that Romans 12 talks about. That by testing, you will discern what the will of God is. Well, then I knew I was supposed to stay where I was staying. And I surrendered to that, and I'm still surrendered to that. And God has done great miracles and has sustained me uh, at times miraculously, no doubt, where, where I'm at where I am. But, you know, like Paul in this situation or with my particular situation, you know, there, there's times when you might consult a lawyer. There's times when you might consult a specialist. There's times when, so what we're saying is it, there's plenty of, of scripture that indicates you don't just lie down and take whatever comes, but you have to sense in your heart, okay, now is the time I, I think I really need to push back, or now is the time I need to surrender and just keep my mouth shut. And those times are hard to discern, aren't they? You only discern those times as you walk through the process. And that heart, if you do push back, you push back always in the heart of being fully surrendered to God's will knowing that he is in charge. He's in charge. I, you know, I had to deal with the fact that God was in charge of the mind of that hiring manager that said, no, we're not going to take Richard. We're going to go with this other guy. God was in charge of that decision. I believe that. I put there in your notes, also consider these following scriptural passages. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 21. Were you a bondservant? When you became a Christian, then don't be concerned about it. You know, people were being converted, becoming Christians, and they were thinking, well, I can't have any Lord but Jesus. I've got to get out of this situation. And, and Paul is reassuring them, no, you don't, have to, you don't have to bail out. Realize that God is, if you are a bondservant, God is even in control of that. And he will deliver you when it's his time in his way. But then look what Paul adds parenthetically, but if you can gain your freedom, do what? Avail yourself of the opportunity. So it's, this is a tricky part of life, but yet we are always of the attitude, I'm wholly surrendered to whatever God has for me. Proverbs 22, verse 3, the prudent sees danger and hides himself, but the simple go on and do what? suffer for it. And we have examples in our congregation here where wives have left husbands because they were being abused by the husband. Uh, they saw the danger and they hid themselves. They escaped. They got out of that situation. And God was with them and helped them in the process to do so. So, you know, in these principles, as always, there's balance, isn't there? We have to be wise as we consider these things. Uh, Matthew chapter 10, verse 23, when they persecute you in one town, do what? Flee to the next. You don't necessarily have to stay there. Now, we all know stories of, of missionaries who have stayed in town, in that locality, even though they were being persecuted and God preserved them, protected them. Sometimes they were uh, ambushed and died, and but the will of the Lord be done. But Jesus is saying here, you don't necessarily just have to stay in that bad situation. If it's possible, flee to the next town. I was excited when I saw on the prayer list that you know Pastor Emmanuel found a new rental home. They were... Uh, he was under threat. His family was in danger where they were staying. And I think he did the right and wise thing to move on, to find a new home to rent. And thank God for providing them that safety in that way. 
But we always have this attitude, Romans 12, verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. And I know I've, I've explained it before, but just to say it one more time, this living sacrifice is you placing yourself upon the offering, upon the altar, as a burnt offering to be wholly sacrificed, wholly consumed by God's will. And it's the attitude of, God, I will follow you wherever. You are the master, I'm the servant, lead on. And I accept all things as coming from your hand. And even in the painful things, even in the times of suffering, you will be there as my comfort, as my joy, as my peace. And I will be more than a conqueror, even in the hardest of times, because you are with me. But that surrender of heart has got to be there, and oh, what a sweet peace comes into your soul when you are absolutely surrendered to His will. Matthew chapter 8, verse... Uh, chap chapter 11, excuse me. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Come unto me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest. It brings such a sweet peace when you can say, God, I surrender to you even in these circumstances. Take my yoke upon you. And we see here a contrast. I mean, normally you would be the one putting the yoke on the ox, right? But now he's saying, you take the yoke upon yourself. You're the one that has to make this choice and decision. Nobody can make it for you. And Jesus is not going to force it on you. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. And if you will learn of my ways and my wisdoms, and how in all things I am always working for your eternal good. If you are learned from me, my love and my care from you, and how when, when you hurt, I hurt, and I will always be there to be your source of strength and comfort. If you will just learn from me in these times, you will discover that I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls because no matter what is threatening your life, no matter what is threatening your safety or security, you will find rest in knowing that you are in my care, in the center of my will. He says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Even when God's plan takes you to unexpected, strange, or hard places and circumstances, there will always be a divine peace and joy and rest. There will always be an enabling grace in the center of God's will. You can safely surrender and safely trust in God as that living sacrifice. To be in the center of God's will is to be in the center of His care and His strength. The second thing, the second thing that's necessary for us to enter into God's rest, the first one was this absolute surrender but then secondly, there is a true ceasing from our own labor. You know, as you spend time with God, in His Word, in prayer, in worship, you will discover that there is a spiritual river that flows. I don't know how else to describe it. It's, it, it's just a flow of His life, a flow of His Spirit. And if through prayer and if through His Word you can find that that invisible, spiritual, flowing river and just cast yourself into it and surrender to it, He really does carry you through life. And we're going to see that here. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9 says, So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For, and this is key, verse 10, whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. So where is the propulsion of your life coming from? Are you living life out of your strength? 
And maybe you're a very intelligent person. Maybe you have lots of charisma. Maybe you have uh, a lot of qualifications and abilities, talent. And maybe you can shine above the rest in and of your own self. But even if all of that is true, it's still your labor. And it still will leave you empty at the end of the day. I mean, talk to the millionaire athletes and talk to the Hollywood success stories and see how miserable they are on the inside and see how tired they get just striving in their own efforts and strength. Remember what this life is, man. You're, you're struggling against sin. You're struggling against Satan. You're struggling against a corrupt world system. This place will wear you out if you're trying to do everything in your own strength. But God is saying here that there is a ceasing from your works. Again, that doesn't mean you're sitting around doing nothing. It's not a change in activity. It's a change in the source of strength. And when you have entered into God's rest, you have cast aside your strength and you're now living and flowing in God's strength. He says in verse 11, let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. God is not just offering this rest to you. He's commanding this rest for you. And He wants to carry you through life. And again, I know that kind of boggles the mind because you think, well, who am I that God should pay attention to someone like me? Does He not realize how many times I have failed and sinned and fallen? Yeah. That's why He wants so much to carry you. That's why He wants so much for you to cease from your own striving and let Him live through you. When Paul said, it's no longer I that live, but Christ who lives in me, do you know he wasn't talking theoretically? This wasn't some mad fairy tale. Paul was actually experiencing Christ living through him to the extent that he could say, it's no longer me. It's not me talking. It's not me conducting my affairs. It's not me performing this. It's Christ in me that is now living through me. Is such a life even possible? Yeah. In fact, it's commanded in the New Testament. And then he says in verse 12, For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. And we were talking about last week, well, what is this? Why did he suddenly shift to the Word of God? What does the Word of God have to do with bringing us into rest? Well, only God's Word can bring us into this rest. And the way that it does it is that the Word of God will begin to expose the roots of our discontentment. It will begin to expose the idols of our heart. What we think we have to have to be content. And it will start to tear down all of those delusions of happiness in and of ourselves. The Word of God will reveal to us the vanity and the exhaustion that comes from serving and pursuing those idols. That control that we're always grappling after. The Word of God will purify our hearts, renewing our minds and cleansing our lives from those idols. I think we've all experienced times when we read the Word of God and we came upon a verse and we had to read it like 10 more times because God was speaking through that verse in an area of our heart. And we saw how far we fell from living up to that verse. And we started to see all of the ways that we were thinking and all of the decision making that we were doing incorrectly because we didn't realize that this is what we were doing in our heart. But now the verse this verse, this scripture is, is exposing our hearts and it's cleansing and it's purifying us from whatever that control mechanism in us was doing. And we realized, I was doing this in my own strength. The Word of God illuminates God's wisdom and God's ways. 
you know, we finally figure out, look how I've messed up my life. Surely if I turn my life over to God, He'll do a much better job. It builds and it strengthens our communion with and our faith in God and in His perfect plan when we start to feed upon the Word of God. So the Word of God is living and active, and it will go into your heart and start changing your heart in ways that you could never even imagine and in ways that you could never do for yourself. And you will learn by the Word of God what it's like to walk with Him on a daily basis. The Word of God will bring us into that divine flow of God's Spirit. Romans chapter 8, verse 11. Look what this says. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal body through His Spirit who dwells in you. And it's easy to look at that verse and to say, well, that's talking about heaven, you know, when we receive our glorified body. But it's really not. This afternoon, you may want to read through Romans chapter 8. And the whole context of Romans chapter 8 is life here on planet Earth in the flesh. And it's saying here that if Jesus Christ is in you, living through you, then you can deny the passions of the flesh and live free from sin. And so here in verse 11, this is all in the context of this life. And so tomorrow morning, when you get up and you go to work or you do whatever you do on a Monday morning, it can be the resurrection life of Jesus Christ living in you that's propelling you that is giving you the strength, that is giving you the cheerfulness and the joy to do whatever it is you have to do. You don't have to live life under your own power. You can live life by the power of the resurrected Jesus is what Romans 8.11 is saying. We already mentioned Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. My gosh, what do you think would happen if you could actually live this? Huh? That is the goal. And I think if you look back over the past 10, 20, 30 years of your life, you can say, yes, I am much closer to this than I've ever been before. Thank God. He's brought me this far. But this is a goal that we're always striving for while we're here on earth. Romans 8 verse 14 says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are what? The sons of God. Well, who are the sons of God? The sons of God are those that act like God, those that look like God, those that talk like God, right? But the key is that word led. That word led, ago in the Greek, it means to lead by laying hold of. You know? I think I've told, shared this before. There were times where I would reach down and grab Jonathan or Jessica. They, they would be in their overalls, you know. With, and I, if they weren't going in the right direction or coming fast enough, I'd just reach down, pick them up, and carry them. And that is actually what this verse is talking about. To lead by laying hold of, to bring to the point of destination. It means to move, to impel. It means to actually to carry. You can be carried by God's life and strength tomorrow. You don't have to live life on your own. How do we live in the divine flow? John 15, verse 4. Abide in me and I in you. So how do we do this? How do we get it actually working? Well, John 15, 4 says that it's through relationship. And in some ways, the, the best way that I can try to relate it is it's like riding a bike. Remember the, the very first time, and I know it's been decades ago, but remember when you, uh, your dad took the training wheels off your bike and for the very first time you rode the bike yourself? And, you know, everybody around you watching you was shouting out suggestions. Right? Pedal faster, pedal slower, coast, lean right, lean left. And they're all, and their uh, suggestions were all good. But you know the feel of the bike, right? 
Only you can learn how to ride that bike. Only you can learn the feel of what it means to be in balance. Only you can learn how to ride that bike to where after a while you don't have to think about it. You know, oh, I need to lean a little bit right now. Or I need to lean into this curve. Or I better slow down because that curve's coming up, coming up quick, right? How do you explain that to someone? How do you teach that to someone? You don't. They've got to learn it for themselves. And so abiding in Christ and Him abiding in you, you've got to figure out the rhythm and flow of that on your own. And you know what? The Holy Spirit is all too happy to teach you. He wants you to live in that ebb and flow of the Holy Spirit. So he says, abide in me and I in you, and as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that does what? Bears much fruit. And we've talked about the fact before, you know, this plant or this tree grows, it blossoms, it produces fruit. And you can sit there and watch a tree for the entire year and not figure out how it does it. It just, it's this inner life. And you don't see the sap flowing and you don't see uh, the tree drawing water up out of the earth, but it's happening. And that's what it's like walking with God. You're walking in communion with God. You're walking in fellowship with Him. And there is this internal drawing upon the Holy Spirit. There is this internal drawing upon the Word of God. And all through the day, you are receiving His life flow. Until you can say with Paul, I'm not doing this anymore. This is God living through me. He it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. And we all know that apart from Him, you can do a lot of things, but it's not worth anything. There's no life in it. There's no joy in it. There's no peace in it. And so how do we live in that divine flow? It's, it's, it's learning to live by relationship. It's learning to live by communion with Father. And I, we don't have time this morning. I mean, there, there's Bible study. There's prayer. There's meditation. There's worship. There's fellowship. There's a lot of things that we could talk about. But ultimately, it all comes down to relating with God, communing with God, talking to Him, Him talking to you, you walking through the day with Him. And that divine life begins to manifest. So why can we confidently enter God's rest? We're going to finish with this, and we're going to do this quickly. But in Psalms 46, verse 10, it says, be still and know that I am God. And that is really what stops all of the striving in our heart. Just be still and know that God is in control. And I don't have to fuss or fume or fear. I can just relax and depend upon Him to carry out His plan in my life. Just be still. In fact, in the in the uh, Christian Standard Bible, it says this. It says, stop fighting and know that I am God. Why are you always fighting and struggling and striving and mad at the world and snapping off people's heads and just stop? Realize God is in control. You can be at peace. And you can cease from all of those destructive emotions and thoughts within. The New American Standard Version says, stop striving and know that I am God. This is the, the divine rest that it's talking about. Well, God has promised rest for the temporal. And again, this is really quick. But Psalms 15, Psalm 16, verse 5 says, The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. And we're all familiar with the phrase, my lot in life. You look at your life, you look at the circumstances, you, you look at what you have, what you don't have, and you say, this is my lot in life. 
Well, remember Psalms 139 says that all of our days are written in His book. And so there's really nothing in life that happens by chance or by accident or by coincidence. God is my lot in life. He is in control of my life. The lines have fallen for me in what? In pleasant places. You may look back at your life and say, man, I've been through some rough times if you're looking at it circumstantially. But how many of you can also look back at your life and say, my, look how God has saved me. Look how God has preserved me. Look how He has delivered me. And that's what the psalmist is talking about here. With the experience of life, more and more you realize God has really taken care of me all along the way. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. So if that's the case, and if he really is in charge of my life here on earth, do I really have anything to fear? I mean, what am I getting so anxious about? And I'm preaching to myself because I'm probably the biggest worrier in the room. But what do we have to fear if he orders my steps? What do I have to fear if he's speaking to me, this is the way, walk in it, whenever I turn to the left or to the right? What do I have to fear when this God is so involved in me and my life? That's why Jesus said in Matthew 6, verse 27, which of you by being anxious can add a single hour to his span of life? That's one way to look at it, isn't it? All of your worry and anxiety and frustration, and you can't even add a single hour to your life. So what are we so upset about? What are we so anxious about? And he goes on in verse 31, and he says, Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things. The Gentiles. You know those people who are without God? And so what Jesus is saying here, why are you so anxious? Why are you acting like people who have no God? You have a God. You have a heavenly Father who knows that you need these things. Don't you know that He will care and provide for everything you need? So do this instead. Seek first the kingdom of God. That's like what we were talking about before. How do I enter this rest? Well, one of the ways is you seek first His kingdom. You make living in the will of God, worshiping Him throughout the day, listening for His voice, meditating on His Word. You make those things the priority of the day, and as you do, all of these temporal things will be what? Added to you. When you put God first, and when you put Him out in front of every day, He will provide in miraculous, in wonderful ways. Therefore, don't be anxious about tomorrow. Tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So, God provides rest in our temporal lives, in our earthly lives. We have nothing to fear from circumstances as long as we are on this earth because God is in control. But we can also rest in adversity. Psalms 46 verse 1 says, God is our refuge and strength. He is a very present help in trouble. So when you are in the worst possible trouble that you could ever be in, God is right there. He is very present in your trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way. I mean, what if the ground beneath us, this, this very moment, just it just divided? And there was nothing left to stand on. And we just fall into this bottomless hole. That's what he's talking about. I mean, he's going to the extreme just to try to describe how safe we are. He's saying, even if the earth gives way, even if the mountains are moved into the heart of the sea and there's no firmament for us to even be stable on, there's no reason for us to fear. Because God is with us even in 
that very trouble. He says there, though its waters roar and foam and though the mountains tremble at its swelling, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. We know from the New Testament who is the habitation of the Most High. We are. Right? The new Jerusalem that's going to come down out of heaven one day is the bride of Christ. That's us. God is inhabiting us. And he says, in that habitation, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. In your worst nightmare, if you will look for it, there is a river of God's life and joy and peace. And you can drink from it in the very worst of times. When the whole world is collapsing around you and you are hurting so badly, God provides a source of life and refreshment and strength for you. Look for the river. It will be there. Because God is very present in your times of need. And then we also know 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being what? Renewed day by day. Your outer self might be getting older and weaker every day, but your inner self is getting younger and stronger every day. And so we can rest even in adversity. We can rest for our temporal needs because He has promised to supply everything that we need. We can rest in adversity because He has provided a river of life to sustain us and to strengthen us in the times of trouble. And we can rest for all eternity. We can rest for the eternal. Have you ever gone through times in your Christian life where you're worried about, maybe I won't make it to heaven? Maybe I'm going to end up in hell after all? And that scares you? You don't have to be scared about the eternal. Look at Hebrews 10.10. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. What? Once for all. If you are a child of God today, God has provided in Jesus Christ, He has already provided everything necessary for you to get to heaven. Period. It's done. Your residency in heaven is not up for question. You have been sanctified in Christ once for all. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 18. This is, Peter, this is Paul saying to Timothy, The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into His heavenly home. It doesn't matter what's happening to you here on earth. It doesn't matter how bad things are getting. It doesn't matter how much your enemies are winning. God will bring you safely into His heavenly home. You have that promise of God. Getting to heaven is all about what Jesus did on the cross. It's really not about what you do. Now we do have to submit and obey. And, you know, maybe you're asking, well, gee, do you believe in the eternal security? Uh, I do believe in eternal security. And I would believe it as others believe it, except there's other Bible verses that kind of wreak havoc. <laughs> and that indicate that if we don't abide in the vine, if we don't bear fruit, then we will be cast out as a dead branch and burned. So that kind of settles that question. But if you have a heart for God, and I know you failed, and God has failed, and I know how I have failed, but if you have a heart for God and you're seeking after Him, the Lord will usher you safely into His heavenly kingdom. And it does not matter how many failures or sins or faults that you see in yourself. For all that you see in yourself, let me tell you, you don't see all of them. 
There is even more than what you think. But even with that, God promises to bring you into His heavenly, heavenly kingdom. Look at Philippians 1, verse 6. I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will what? Will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So you mean I don't have to anxiously strive and work harder and labor more intensely to try to get into heaven? No, Jesus has already promised He will get me into heaven. Jesus is the one who began a work in me. Jesus is the one that will bring this work to completion. And the day that I stand before the throne of God being received by my heavenly Father, Jesus is the one to thank, not me. Not my striving. Not my trying. He will bring it to completion on the day of Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 See, there's just too many of these verses to get this wrong. Now may the God of peace Himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You will be presented blameless on that day because of the God who finished the work that He started in you. I love that phrase, He who calls you is faithful, and He will surely what? In your spiritual walk with God, just rest. Be at peace. Know that you're not going to get to heaven by any endeavor of your own. Know that what God started in Christ on the cross of Calvary, His resurrection life in you is now finishing and it will bring it to completion to get you to heaven. You can relax. Don't try to add your labors to what God has already perfected in Jesus Christ. Just let the work of God be worked in you and through you day by day. Abide in Him. If you abide in Him, if you just fellowship with Him and enjoy His presence day by day, He will make all of the changes in you that are necessary. He will do everything in you and everything in your life to make sure that you make it to heaven. Look at Jude chapter 1. It only has one chapter. Verse 24 now to Him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of His glory with great joy. To the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. But Jesus will keep you from stumbling. He will present you blameless before the presence of His glory. And sanctification is all His work, not our work. It's our work to surrender to. It's our work to stay in communion with. It's our work to abide in Him. But then He does all the rest. And so we can rest. We, as we think in, about heaven and hell and where am I going, be at peace. God has saved you. And He will continue to keep you and He will deliver you into His heavenly kingdom blameless. So what do we have to worry about? Really nothing. He takes care of everything along the way, doesn't He? That's the divine rest. So Father, we thank You for what You have worked in Jesus Christ. We do thank You that we can come to You and surrender to Your work, Your plans, Your wisdom. Father, we thank You that as we surrender, we can cease from our own striving and efforts. We can abide in You, and as we do, we can find that river of life that will just flow through us. Streams of power, streams of life, streams of peace, streams of joy. And we can just be carried by the current all the way to heaven. Father, we thank You for this. And Lord, we seek today to enter into that divine rest of being still and knowing that You are God. You've got this. It's in Your hands and under Your control. And we can be at rest just like Jesus sleeping in the back of the boat in the midst of a storm. 
Father, teach us how to rest, we ask. Keep us safe as we go now in Jesus' name. Amen.